Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's August 5th, 2019, and we are uh, in the middle of several good hours, precious hours, golden hours with Anthony Miller. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know who, for some reason, are tuning in a little bit midway, uh, Anthony has been known for many years, kind of on Mormon Facebook and, and elsewhere, as a very thoughtful and gracious, uh, diplomatic and wise voice uh, for those who are transitioning away from orthodoxy and or out of Mormonism. And uh, he, has, he has blogged a lot, he's written a lot on Facebook, and he started to do interviews on podcasts and even speak. He spoke at Thrive June 2019, and he speaks at Sunstone regularly, and uh, he's just one of those beloved, wise, uh, thoughtful, kind people, and we love to have those types of people on Mormon Stories Podcast, if you haven't noticed. So uh, we've just spent several hours talking about Anthony's background growing up in the church, his uh, many years in the church, including his mission as a very orthodox member, um, and then we spent a lot of time with uh, talking about his de deconstruction and the cracks that developed in his faith and what led to him losing his faith and how, uh, how low he got uh, to the point of uh, kind of being rescued by, by various resources in Mormonism, including several podcasts, Sunstone, um, uh, other friends and, and relationships, and uh, the Thoughtful Faith Group, etc., and the, the last we left it was with, with him uh, kind of reconciling his, his uh, loss of faith and telling his priesthood leadership and, uh, and, you know, his wife knowing and his gay son knowing. And, and I think we kind of, it's kind of time to talk about reconstruction a little bit, even more than we've already talked about it. Yep. Is, is that right? Uh, a little bit more on deconstruction, and then yeah. the emphasis of the story really is on reconstruction. Yeah. So really quick, we will, for those who are joining us live, just to let you know what's up, we'll be talking about the, a uh, little bit more about his deconstruction, then we'll be talking about reconstruction. And we've got a lot of special topics that we're going to be talking about as well. I've got a list of like 20 questions I want to ask. So there will be kind of an informal part of this interview where it's just two guys who spent a lot of time thinking and talking about Mormonism, just talking about uh, what's up and and progressive moment, Mormonism, post Mormonism, community of Christ, the the current church, uh, general authority compensation. We'll be talking about a, a lot of cool, fun, interesting things, and then if there's time today, we'll actually kind of close that, and then we'll we'll allow Anthony to give his Thrive presentation to me and to us so that we can record it and make sure we share that. And tell us what that's about. Uh, the Thrive presentation was about growing through grief and a sense of loss and betrayal and growing through that in a healthy way and then beyond. And that's super important. So lots of cool stuff ahead. For those joining us live on uh, Facebook, we welcome you. Please share this around on groups, on your wall. And please make comments and questions for Anthony. I'll do my best to call those uh, during the parts where he's telling the story. And then at, at the end, I'll incorporate questions and comments. And if you love Anthony, uh, share that. If you don't love Anthony, that for that one person out there that may not love Anthony, you don't have to say anything, it's okay. Uh, but the rest of you, please do share. Feel free to effusively uh, heat praise upon uh, Anthony. Uh, yeah, because my <laughs> second most important love language is words of affirmation. So go for it. Open up. I Open love it. it. Up. Yeah, Let it fly. absolutely. So, um, uh, in any event, um, so I, I deconstructed, uh, uh, church history. And, um, as I was deconstructing church history, um, I saw these models out there of individuals who, um, practice a thoughtful faith with the premise that they held on to a form of Christianity and they practiced that Christianity uh, through the tool of the Latter-day Saint Church, or we used to call it the Mormon Church. And um, 
And uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. And so I thought, you know, if it takes Dan Wertherspoon a couple decades to do this, I surely should be able to do this you know, in 12 or 14 months or something like that, right? <laughs> uh, I didn't actually explicitly think that, but the, I, I thought that I could reconstruct a sense of uh, nuanced Mormonism. And it, it was something that I, uh, even though um, my capacity to sit with ambiguity uh, and, and an incre- a cre- increased sense of nuance relative to what I had before, um, even though that capacity had increased, I still had this underlying uh, sense of concern or anxiety of needing to figure out a way to reconstruct, to reconnect with my tribe. Um, even if I got banned, you know, to be called to the primary uh, for, for the rest of my life, to just to be able to reconnect with my friends. Like, I, I love these people, hundreds of them and hundreds um, and, and my community. And to be able to sit with my wife and church and so forth. But every time I tried, it was so incredibly wounding. It was so incredibly difficult um, that um, anyway, I was in the struggle with that. So I thought if I could deconstruct Christianity and then come up with some sort of reconstruction with regard to Christianity, I could practice a sense of Christian faith. And I, I read uh, you know books from Richard Rohr and I read materials from Marcus Borg and John Shelby Spong and and Rob Bell, I loved stuff from Rod Bell and and blog posts from Rachel Held Evans and so forth. And so I was interested in this idea of, of uh, Christianity. Um, the Liturgist podcast was a huge help to me. And uh, Mark uh, McCarg's uh, book, Finding God in the Waves, he, he's Science Mike on, on that show. That, that was really helpful for me, even though I hadn't had a similar reconstructive experience to what he did. So... In any event, so I took a deep dive, and um, one of my friends suggested that I start with uh, Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus. So I did, uh, and realized uh, that the story of the Gospels in the New Testament is a lot less uh, literally reliable or a lot less literal than I had always been led to believe. And um, I continued to study books from Bart Ehrman and John Shelby Spong and but then I figured, you know, I reconcile this because this is how my brain works. I figured that Mormonism is foundationally based on, on the Old Testament, right? Because polygamy was a restoration of Abraham's polygamy. And Moses, you know, visits Joseph Smith to, in person to bestow keys. Uh, and... Uh, and the LDS construct of Jesus, atonement and resurrection, uh, if it's literal, seems to be very reliant on a literal fall, a literal Adam, and a literal garden. And so I studied uh, Old Testament. Uh, you know, I got uh, Bakavoy's uh, book, and I uh, also... Um, spent time with uh, the Bible unearthed as well. And um, what I reconciled as I went through that is foundationally the problems with the church aren't the gospel topics essays or even, you know, the CS letter stuff. Um, And I'll give a couple examples. So, um, two books that were very vital to my faith journey and reconstruction were Sapiens and God, a Human History. And in those books, uh, Yuval Harari and Reza Aslan um, talk about how human beings perceive spirituality or perceive a connection of something greater than themselves. And as part of human evolution, social evolution, we what we did as human beings is we created Uh, symbols or fictions or folklore or myth constructs to be able to communicate and express and talk about our experiences with the divine. And so not specifically in those books, an example of that would be, you know, the messiness of our ancestors who didn't understand why a volcano would go off. And so they invented uh, a myth construct uh, with this idea that there's a volca- there might be volcano gods 
and the volcano gods have certain requirements and behavioral litmus tests and required sacrifices and so forth uh, in this myth tradition in order to appease the volcano gods so that the volcano wouldn't erupt. And what human beings did is when they found things that were unexplainable, they would create myths in order to provide context for the unexplainable. And through most of history, it seems like humanity has accepted that they're myths, you know? Like, like uh, Yuval Harari in his book Sapiens explains that for, for groups of larger than about 150 people to function with each other, they need to have a common myth. And an example of a myth is the myth of, of currency. So currency is just a symbol that represents an exchange of value, whether it's time or, or whatnot. It's not actually a real thing. It, it, it's just a fiction. And in the same way, we create other kinds of fictions with regard to borders, for example. Uh, if you're standing on the other side of the border to Canada and I'm, on in, and I'm in the United States, like we're both human beings. This idea that you're a Canadian and I'm a United States citizen, that's just a human-made, man-made myth construct, right? That human beings created so that we could protect ourselves and so that we could interact with each other. So um, Harari and Reza Aslan explained uh, in their books how important myth constructs are. And um, to a greater extent, Reza Aslan explains the development of myth constructs with regard to the divine and God uh, and how human beings create God and they envision God with human characteristics because it makes God more relatable and so forth. And they develop these over time. And the somewhat in our human history uh, invention uh, or development of the Yahweh myth construct Fiction, fiction, legend, tradition, however you want to call it. By myth, I'm, I'm not saying that it's not real. Uh, by my myth, I, I'm, I'm saying that it, it, it's a story that's developed in order to be able for human beings to protect themselves and to connect and so forth. In any event, uh, the Old Testament, uh, what I found as I studied the development of the Old Testament, that the, the books attributed to Moses, first of all, um, the consensus of scholars is that the character of Moses in scriptures never existed. So uh, written Hebrew wasn't invented until about 300 years after a character named Moses might have lived upon which whose life legends were created. And um, scholars and David Bakavoy could explain much better than me that the, the Pentateuch or the five books attributed to Moses or a compilation of, from several different source texts of different stories or myth traditions, in many cases that conflict with each other, um, to build what we have today in the five books attributed to Moses. And in the form that we know them today, they weren't actually created until after the Babylonian captivity. So maybe 538 BCE. Um, and... Uh, with Mormonism, that's a problem because that means there was no such thing as a Pentateuch in the way that we know it, at least, in 600 BC, compiled in a biblical text with a whole bunch of books on a set of brass plates. Like, that didn't exist, right? You know? And, and there are other <coughs> uh, Jewish origin myths that are entirely mythical, meaning that uh, there are stories, there are fictions. Um, and maybe there's some element of historicity that a legend was created out of, but they're, they're, they're myths. They're, we know that between 3000 and 2000 BCE, the population of the earth was between 50 and 60 million people. And there were diverse languages and cultures and spiritual practices. But the Jewish origin myth is that there was a single Adamic language and then a Tower of Babel, and then a confounding of tongues or languages. And out of that Jewish origin myth, which is totally non-historical, like it's, it's the same as a flat earth myth, it's the same as a global flood myth, it's a myth. It's not something that actually happened. But out of the Tower and the confounding of language myth, you, Joseph Smith didn't realize that the Old Testament wasn't historical. 
you know, that they were origin myths, never meant to be literally historical. Because he didn't have the geology and, and Darwin and no. the radiocarbon dating and no. all of the sorts of things that would have allowed him to know that the timeline didn't add up. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Jewish origin myths were his construct of how everything came to be. Yeah. He didn't know that. I, I, sometimes I say, uh, if Joseph Smith was a Muslim and he believed in the literal historicity of the Quran, the Book of Mormon would have been about a different tribe. The Book of Mormon is Joseph Smith's actualization of his perceptions of divinity and the historicity of the Bible. Um, and he created that, I think Dan Vogel's reconciliation, the pious fraud uh, reconciliation, it has a pretty compelling argument. You know, uh, I'm getting sidetracked, but um, the pious fraud theory, like if you go to Venice Beach to a faith healer, the faith healer knows that what they're doing is a fraud. But they also know that if they provide something to you that gives you sufficient faith in what they're doing, whether it's placebo effect or, or serendipity or whatever, some people are going to experience healing, right? And I think Joseph Smith knew that what he was creating in the Book of Mormon, uh, as he dictated or narrated those stories, he, he knew that they were stories, right? Uh, some of them based on him and his family, some of them borrowed from other ideas and as an eclectic aggregator, actually quite as a, a genius, like, like if you were to take somebody like Rob, comedian Robin Williams and put him next to Joseph Smith, like, I think they probably would have some similar similarities, you know, in terms of their creativity. But, uh, in any event, Joseph actualized his, uh, perception of biblical Jewish origin myths and to answer all the pressing questions of the day for his family and in the New England area, in the Northeastern United States at the time, uh, to answer all the questions from infant baptism to universalism and all that kind of stuff. And he actualized that, and, and, and the pious fraud theory, to my understanding, it says that um, Joseph Smith believed what he was doing, even though it was fraudulent, was from God because it brought people to his perception of Jesus, right? And so it can't be wrong you know, even though I'm committing a fraud, it can't be wrong if it's bringing people to uh, what his perception of Jesus was. And it was so convincing. I think, you know, everybody has different reconciliations, but most of the early leaders uh, totally believed him. You know, I, I think that Oliver Cowdery, you know, knew some, there was some messiness in it, but I think Oliver Cowdery actually thought that, you know, the maybe cumulative three hours a day during the dictation of the Book of Mormon, um, that Joseph Smith was speaking, and then maybe the other 10 plus hours a day that he was pondering in his heart and skipping rocks and studying his Bible and praying and coming up with more ideas that he could put into those three hours a day of dictation. I think, I think Oliver Cowdery probably believed that something divine was happening. But in any event, uh, back to the Jewish origin myth thing and... Uh, Here's the problem. If there was more than a single Adamic language, and if the Tower of Babel story is a myth, an origin myth, and it didn't happen, that means the brother of Jared's story is a myth, right? Created because Joseph Smith believed it was literal history. Uh, that's a problem, but it's not only a problem for uh, the Book of Ether, it's a problem because the Nephite interpreters are said to have initiated with the brother of Jared. So if the brother of Jared is a myth, then the stones that would become the Nephite interpreters are a myth. Kind of like if we had a device that was related to the flat earth myth in the, in the Jewish origin myths, that device would be mythical if it was born out of the flat earth myth. And so um, the brother of Jared is a myth, the rocks that would become the Nephite interpreters from the Barad, brother of Jared is a myth. Um, King Mosiah using those Nephite interpreters to translate Jaredite 24 Jaredite gold plates, that would be a myth. Uh, Moroni using the Nephite interpreters to do a language translation from the Adamic language or whatever the single language was of the brother of Jared into what would be the two-thirds sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, the grand revelation, uh, 
uh, you know, it would be like 1,500 pages of text because if the Book of Mormon's 500, you know, uh, or it'd be 1,000 pages of text. Um, that's a problem. So Moroni is using mythical Nephite interpreters to translate the Adamic language into Hebrew and writing it in Reformed Egyptian into what would become the two-third seal portion. And uh, then Joseph Smith using the brother of Jared's mythical Tower of Babel origins Nephite interpreters, you know, to study the characters or to translate anything, you know, or whatever, however you used them, that would be a myth. And the whole historicity, in my view, of the Book of Mormon crumbles if we just accept that the Tower of Babel and the single Adamic language uh, Jewish origin myth from the New Testament is a myth. But it doesn't stop there because um, the, the Noah myth is adapted from the Gilgamesh myth, right? Noah wasn't a real person. There wasn't a 600-year-old man who built a ark and put a zoo in it. Uh, and that's a problem because the book of Abraham has uh, a literal descendant of Cain, who's not a real person. That's an origin myth. Uh, having black skin go through a literal historical ham, uh, Noah's son, which is a myth. And then having a, Noah's granddaughter, Egyptus, discovering Egypt after the waters receded from the global flood. And the global flood is a myth, like we know, we know that. Uh, to discover Egypt, and then there was a righteous pharaoh, which is anachronistic, um, that couldn't have the priesthood, and it's all based on the flood myth. And the flood myth is a myth. And Cain is a myth, and Ham is a myth, and water, flood waters over Egypt is a myth. And so you can argue all you want about different reconciliations for the book, book of Abraham, but if the flood myth is a myth, it's a problem, right? And the consensus of scholars is that the other biblical patriarchs, in the form that they're represented in scriptures, aren't historical at all. Like if you ask a biblical scholar who's not apologetic whether Abraham existed, they might say, do you mean the Abraham of scripture or do you mean the Abraham of history? And they'll say, well, the Abraham of scripture was this character. But the, what they'll tell you, if they're honest about it, is the Abraham of history didn't exist. There was no man that was about 100 years old that had a kid with his slave, with the approval of God, to impregnate his slave, uh, and then had a subsequent child with a woman that was almost 100 years old. That is an origin myth. Um, uh, Moses is a composite, composite legendary character. The consensus of scholars is that Moses, the character, didn't exist. The Exodus, the consensus of scholars is, while there might have been some people that moved out of Egypt and ended up going into to the Canaanite area, the Moses of scriptures is a mythical character, um, and the Exodus is a myth. Um, it, while not a full consensus it's pretty clear also that the story of the lost 10 tribes is a complete origin myth. It's totally non-historical. So that's a problem for your patriarchal blessing that tells you that you came from tribes that were mythical, right? And it makes a problem for the historicity of the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon is foundationally based on this gathering of the lost tribes but the Lost Tribe story is a non-historical myth. So the Exodus is a myth, the Tower of Babel is a myth, the Flood is a myth, the Garden of Eden is a myth, a literal historical fall of a character named Adam, total myth. You don't even need to read the CS letter to realize that there is a problem with Mormonism if those are all origin myths, right? Because the, the LDS, the Latter-day Saint construct of Jesus is foundationally based on literalism of a literal historical fall and a literal historical atom. And if that becomes allegory, it takes a tremendous amount of nuance to come up with this idea that there would need to be a literal historical atonement. Like, you can't have one without the other. Uh, 
And I think we see that. Uh, maybe we'll visit about this a little bit later. Um, but that's a level of dissonance and a shelf item that a lot of people have that accept that evolution is real. And so then they come up with some sort of reconciliation. Well, maybe Adam was the first person that actually had a spirit in them or something like that. But it, it's all very, very, very difficult. So in any event, um, so I deconstructed the Bible and recognized that, you know, Jonah wasn't a literal historical person. It was a satirical allegory. It's a beautiful story that was written by writers to, to offer a, a pushback or uh, a contrary view to the other Hebrew writings that suggest that God could care or not about non-Israelites. You know, the, the, the story of Jonah is this beautiful satirical allegory. It's not historical. There was never a person named Jonah who spent time in a fish. That's an origin myth, right? But people who hold on literalism need Jonah to be a real person because in what ended up in the Gospels attributed to the historical Jesus is this idea that the sign of Jonah would be... Um, you know, evidence that Jesus was uh, divine and resurrected. Um, but, but the historical Jesus never said that, you know, because if you study Bartram and another biblical scholarship, um, that the, the gospels were written by the equivalent of, you know, grandchildren or great grandchildren of contemporaries to Jesus in a totally foreign language. It was written in educated Greek. Jesus and his followers spoke Aramaic. Most of them probably weren't literate. Um, and, uh, and the gospels, while they have some historical information in them, they're very messy. They're not reliable eyewitness accounts. Um, they were anonymously written. Uh, Mark was the oldest. Soon after that, there was the Jewish siege, uh, the Jerusalem siege where the Romans came in and killed, you know, over a million Jews and crucified them across the side of the road. So the writers of the gospel told this story of the creator of the universe coming and taking on divine form and suffering the same fate that the Jewish people did, being crucified along the side of the road in the Jerusalem siege. And it's, it's just really messy. Uh, Matthew and Luke are have a lot of direct borrowing and then conflicts with Mark. Mark is the earliest gospel. Uh, there's also supposedly a Q source that told some of the miracle stories. Um, that ended up in Mark and Luke. So Mark and Luke were like, they call it the synoptic problem, but they were borrowing from other sources. They weren't eyewitness accounts. They were written very, very late. And then John is like not considered a synoptic gospel. It's, it, it's written way, way late. Um, it wasn't written by the apostle John. And, and if you read the scriptures, the New Testament, in the order that they were written, you can see an evolution of Christology. So uh, Jesus becomes divine in Mark at his baptism. There's nothing about his birth. And then whoever wrote Matthew and Luke have an evolved Christology where Jesus becomes divine at his birth. And they, then they try to, in a non-historical sense, impute Moses archetypes into the Jesus. But we know that Matthew chapter 2 is not historical because Herod died in 4 BC you know, and there's all sorts of problems there. And then late, 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 when the gospel of John comes around, Jesus isn't only divine at birth, he's divine since the beginning. And uh, there's almost nothing in the book of John that's actually historical. It's primarily a theological book that creates a totally different Jesus going around saying that he's Jehovah, he's the great I am from the beginning. One of the most beautiful stories in the book of John uh, I'm going to share this anyway, since it's, but it's a tangent, is the story of the woman taken in adultery. It's a beautiful story. It never happened. It's a late edition. It's not in the earliest uh, text and manuscripts. But uh, the story of the woman taken in adultery, it, what ha happens is it's during one of these Jewish uh, harvest festivals. And during this particular Jewish har harvest festival, it corresponds with uh, the words of the prophet Jeremiah. And in the words of prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah is condemning, uh, the, the Lord, Yahweh, is condemning his people through Jeremiah and saying, if you don't do what you need to be doing, your name isn't worth the dust or your name isn't worth what's written in the dust, something like that. So in that context, this story is placed in this Jewish festival time. 
that uh, during these Jewish festivals, they'd all get together and they'd get in tents and they'd drink wine and they'd sleep around and they'd commit adultery and they'd party. And that's what they would do during festivals. It's like Sturgis, but without motorcycles, right? <laughs> and, and so in the story, all these Jewish leaders who totally were committing adultery and drinking and all that kind of stuff, hypocritically bring this woman caught in the very act of adultery that they most likely were doing as well. And they bring her you know, with a blanket around her, uh, caught in the very act to Jesus and, and say, you know, we've caught this woman in adultery and the law says that we should stone her. And then Jesus doesn't say anything and he gets down on the ground and he starts drawing in the dirt. And for the people that understand the context of this story, they, they, they could perceive that what the writer was trying to say is Jesus was writing their names in the dirt, which said that he was Jehovah. And it was the fulfillment of Jeremiah that their names weren't worth dust. And that's why they all leave, you know. And the story of the woman taken in adultery is a beautiful story. And it's a myth. And there's value in the myth, right? And the early adherents to Christianity understood that it was myth. You know, literalism is a Gentile heresy, according to John Shelby Spong, that's much more recent. They knew it was a myth. Jesus knew that Jonah wasn't a real person. Jesus knew that Noah wasn't a real person. But that's a problem for Mormonism, right? Because, um, well, you don't have to spend any time reading to reconcile polygamy if you know that Abraham wasn't a real person, right? Because you don't have to reconcile that God would approve Abraham having mul you know, multiple wives and having sex with his slave and, and having God approve poly polygamy or that God could approve other things in the Bible, genocide and slavery and other kinds of things. You don't have to reconcile polygamy if you understand that the Abraham of history isn't the Abraham of scripture it's a myth. So there was nothing to restore from God. Like he was never behind slavery or polygamy or anything. And, and the Book of Mormon has the Exodus in it. It has the Lost Ten Tribes. It has a con totally anachronistic biblical compil compil compilation of the Pentateuch. It says that those books were written by Moses or of Moses, indicating they're written by Moses. They weren't written by Moses. They were attributed to a composite mythical character named Moses. So I deconstructed all of this stuff, you know. So how was I going to return and engage in my tribe knowing that the Exodus is a story, you know? How do, how do I go to the temple and participate in ordinances that are based on myths. They're not real, right? And um, so it was really tough. So as I was deconstructing all of those things, th this is the big problem. So, you know, if you want to deconstruct stuff, deconstruct that the Jewish myths, uh, origin myths, aren't literal history. Um, they were never meant to be literal history. They weren't created until around plus or minus 1000 BC, and they weren't really comp compiled into the Pentateuch as we know it today until after the Babylonian captivity. You know, I mean, Deutero, I, Deutero Isaiah and David Bakavoy's great blog posts on that, you know, are problematic for the Book of Mormon. But the deal is, is there, there was no literal fall. There was no Adam. There was no flood. There was no Tower of Babel. And so let's talk about the beauty of the myth, right? Let's have a Sunday school class where we talk about the myth of the story of the woman taken in adultery, and it never happened, and it's beautiful, right? Let's talk about the story of the myth of Jonah. It's a beautiful story, and not have to hold literalism with regard to that. So in any event, I deconstructed all of that. And uh, so, hmm, what did you do next? <laughs> so, um, and that's very common, uh, I think. Over half of people who end up losing their faith in Mormonism become atheist or agnostic because yeah. if you hold the Book of Mormon with the same level of scrutiny that you do, well, if you hold the Bible with the same level of scrutiny of the Book of Mormon or Abraham. It just totally crumbles. As David Bakavoy says, it's just as flawed, if not more so. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, John Hamer, John Hamer actually his studies are more about the Bible. He stopped studying church history ten years ago, and you know he would tell you that the first actual character in the Bible that actually is a literal historical character is David, and the stories attributed to David aren't actually historical. So like <laughs> David didn't k- kill a giant, mm-hmm. you know. And if you read the Bible, there's another story in there that somebody else killed Goliath instead of. David, right? <laughs> right. So, um, so <clears throat> it, it, it's a problem for literalism. So, um, in any event, and Mormonism kind of is a, it, its foundation is a very literalistic. Yeah. Even to the blood promises and the tribes of Israel and the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Like the whole point of the Book of Mormon is to preach to the to the pure blooded lost tribes of Israel, which right. were the Lamanites. Like, and we don't can't know who be they... more explicit. That's not metaphor. Right. Joseph was sending missionaries to the frontiers of the Midwest to convert the Lamanites, right? right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty literal. It's a problem. Yeah. So <laughs> and Joseph... now we don't know who the Lamanites are. So Right, yeah, because DNA, we don't know who they are. Uh, so, um, and they're not flourishing like a rose, uh, <laughs> no. right? So um, in any event... So I, w- I would say, you know, that I kind of deconstructed that. So there, there is something that I would say. So there's this idea of, of uh, pre-rational thought, rational thought, and trans-rational thought. So pre-rational thought is when there are things that you don't understand and you don't know, you can create myths to explain the unknowable. So an example of pre-rational thought is to see a rainbow and think, oh, that is a sign of God. It's a sign of favor or God smiling on us or whatever when we see a rain- rainbow and we're moved and awed by it and we experience uh, a sense of spiritual connection with that. But then eventually we hopefully become educated and we understand rational thought. And rational thought is that a rainbow is light refracting through moisture in the air. That's what it is. It's not a divine being on a crystallized planet near a star called Kolob that lives with his plural, plural wives and something other than blood throwing, flowing through their veins, sh- smiling on us with this divine sign. It's light refracting through water, right? But the challenge is that when we go through a faith deconstruction, we spend a lot of time in rational thought. And, and I think we kind of get stuck there. You know, John Ogden in, in his book talks about truth beauty and goodness and needing to have a balance. And if you only stick in one, it's problematic. And, and that is the same true is true with this model in that after rational thought, the next uh, place to go is trans rational thought. And with trans rational thought, it, it's you, you are present in the moment and you see the beauty of the rainbow. And you know that that's light refracting through moisture in the air but you sense a connection of beauty and meaning, even though you know it's not a divine being somewhere doing something, right? And that's, that's uh, part of the reconstruction. That's accepting that there are myths, accepting that these things aren't literally what they, we thought they were, and then reconstructing a sense of meaning because we found beauty in them. Like I had all these treasured spiritual experiences that I didn't want to get up, give up. You know, in our faith transitions workshop, I was weeping, telling you the story of my friend standing next to me at the veil in the temple with me acting vicariously to bring his wife through the veil. And I needed to know what that was. And so I needed to reconstruct. And so... Um, as part of this experience, I, I knew I needed to return to the mission field because my foundational spiritual experiences were largely uh, experienced in the mission field. And then they were the basis for the balance of how I constructed things. And so in, uh, in fall of 2017... My wife and my son and I, we went and we spent nearly three weeks in Barcelona. And, uh, and when I returned there, I've returned several times since I left my mission. When I returned there, it just so happened that it was going to be state conference where I served. And so it was, it was actually the first time I was back in church since my sabbatical. 
and we went to a state conference uh, Saturday evening adult session uh, of state conference, my wife and I. And I saw all these amazing people who I dearly love and who I served and people I baptized. And um, there were three talks that I would talk about in this state conference. The first talk was um, from my friend who I did joint calls with, and he was a recently returned missionary when I was serving there. Uh, his name is Herman. And Herman was a counselor in the state presidency. And he talked about, I don't remember exactly right now what he talked about, but he talked about things that I felt a sense of spiritual connection to. And I felt what I used to call the spirit during his talk. And then his wife, who's the stake relief study president, I think, maybe the, a counselor, but I think she's the president. She was the first person that I baptized in Hospitalet, Christina. And Christina gave a talk, and I felt a sense of spiritual connection that I would have called the Holy Ghost before. And then after they spoke, um, the mission president got up and spoke. And the mission president uh, there is a retired doctor, I think, from north of Salt Lake somewhere. And he gave a talk about the Word of Wisdom. And he taught and testified of things that are entirely inaccurate from a historical standpoint, totally misrepresenting the history, totally misrepresenting what's in the canon. And looking around me, people were sensing the Spirit. So same thing, you feel this, spirit, something totally inaccurate is being taught and testified of, people feel the spirit. It's not a reliable construct, right? So not only for my experience, but I see this happening in others. And, and I'm needing to reconstruct what spirituality is. So, you know, along the deconstruction, I, I studied what the elevation emotion is. So if you go to Wikipedia and you look up elevation emotion, uh, what elevation emotion is, is that when human beings participate in acts of moral goodness or they perceive them, like when they read scriptures and they ponder in their heart how merciful God has been with his children, you know, that kind of thing when they perceive acts of moral goodness and they ponder it and they contemplate on it uh, and they participate in it or receive it or whatnot, they experience something called the elevation emotion. And the elevation emotion, if you were to read the description of the elevation emotion, it's what Paul writes in Galatians. It's the fruits of the spirit. You feel a warmth and expanding in your, in your heart and in your core. Um, your charitable disposition increases. Your tolerance for others uh, happens as well. Um, this is what we experience that we would call a burning in the bosom, right? And, uh, and Michael Ferguson uh, has a great TED Talk about this, Your Brain on God, where he talks about putting active believing members of the LDS Church in a, in a functional MRI machine and having them uh, uh, read talks or listen to talks or scripture or sing hymns or whatnot or pray that would give them spiritual experience, and then he can track exactly what's happening in their brain when that happens. Um, and then he would also tell you that when people are experiencing elevation emotion, there's a release of dopamine in their system, and that release of dopamine in the system, that's what creates that experience of warmth in your heart, in your chest, or the burning in your bosom. And Mormons are really, really good at acts of moral goodness, right? We... we uh, we have acts of moral goodness in our sacred texts. We do home and visiting teaching or ministering is what they call it now. We do service to others. Um, we're family focused. We have this great community. We do all these things that uh, give this positive feedback loop of experiencing the elevation emotion through practices and acts of moral goodness. Uh, but the construct in Mormonism is that that experience is a divine, w reliable witnesses of tr witness of truth. But in my personal experience, it was demonstrably not because I had those experiences about inaccurate things. And sitting in this state conference, it was demonstrably not because that mission president was teaching and testifying of things uh, emotionally or elevation emotion moved himself about things that were entirely inaccurate. And, and it's not. The construct is a false construct. At least it was there, and it was for me, 
Now, that's my reconciliation. Other people have different reconciliations. So earlier I talked about the um, illusory truth effect, where if you repeat things um, enough, you believe them. Like if kids get up and say, I know the church is true, or the, the testimony is gained in the bearing of it, that's the illusory truth effect. And then there's elevation emotion, where you participate in acts of moral goodness, and you have that spiritual experience uh, that we call, and and then you impute some sort of construct of what that means. And then there's one more thing that happens, and that is confirmation bias. So the way confirmation bias works is, as human beings, we cannot physically see outside of our paradigms. We have blind spots. And an example of that that I think almost all of the viewers would be aware of is, uh, or if I pointed out, they would be aware of it, is the most commonly driven car on a road today is the Honda Accord. You know, that's a rational statistical fact. If you have never driven a Honda Accord, Accord if you have never ridden in one, driven one, rented one, owned in one, most all the Honda Accords on the road are totally invisible to you. You don't see them, hardly at all. Even if you're looking for them intentionally, you're not gonna see them all. But the moment that you buy a Honda Accord and start driving it, you see them all. That's how our brains work. That's how confirmation bias works. So imagine how that works in your sacred text. You read a sacred text with confirmation bias, and you can only physically see what supports your bias. You can't even see the other things. Like I could... I could go today to my active believing friends and I could point out these specific scriptures in the Book of Mormon that are clearly Trinitarian with revivalist trances and things that are totally contrary to current Mormon doctrine today in the Book of Mormon and they could not physically see it because that's how confirmation bias works. They can't see it. And so you add all these things together and I'm seeing this happen uh, in this state conference where this mission president is teaching inaccurate things about the word of wisdom. And I'm starting to put things together. And then over the subsequent weeks, two weeks or so after that, uh, my wife and my son and I, we go to Tar Tarragona and we see Roman ruins and we see devotion to the divine uh, that was around the time of Christ. And we see feminine divine. And we go to the Gaudi uh, museum, and we learn about his devotion to the divine through art and the building of the Sagrada Familia. And we go to the Sagrada Familia. It's a big cathedral that's taken a very long time to build. And we see this severe, uh, sincere devotion to the divine. And people like lived there and spent their whole life building that thing. And we go to the Catholic cathedral uh, in Barcelona that took like hundreds of years to to build, and and we have a rental car, and we drive to this medieval town called Besalú that's north of Barcelona, and we go to this old, ancient Jewish quarter that's in this medieval town. They had ritual bathing baths that have their evidence of devotion to the divine, and that uh, those Jews in that Jewish quarter went underground during the Spanish Inquisition, and it wasn't discovered again until uh, the early 1900s. And we see all this devotion to the divine and we go to Montserrat. Like if you ever go to Barcelona, you need to get on the train or you need to rent a car and you need to go to Montserrat. It's this amazing uh, mountainous uh, mystical experience where there's this monastery and this cathedral and there's this uh, black Madonna and Jesus and so forth. And we did all this and we saw all this huge spectrum of devotion to the divine. And I saw also in state conference this amazing beautiful devotion to the divine in state conference. And, and right at that time is when Reza Aslan's book came out, God of Human History. And on the flight home, I listened to the book where he talks about the creation of myth and devotion to the divine and constructs of God and so forth. And then his view of pantheism. And I, I had never heard of pantheism before, but the premise of pantheism is that, um, uh, there's maybe a divine design, an omnipresent, omnipresent force for good, you know, so like a Star Wars thing, maybe, I don't know. And uh, since it's omnipresent, we're all, all part of it. So we're all divine. There's divinity in you, there's divinity in me, there's divinity 
in our listeners and viewers. And, um, and with pantheism, uh, that's what God is. It's God is everything. And our sense of spiritual connection is as we are fully present in the moment, aware of uh, our own consciousness, the consciousness of others, and participating uh, in, in all this everything, we have divine moments. And uh, I pushed back a little bit as I was reading that, but at the same point, Reza Aslan's construct of pantheism seemed to resonate with me. It, it seemed to have correlations with things that I was reading from Richard Rohr and Rob Bell and others that seemed helpful for me. And even with progressive Mormons uh, who I dealt with in different support groups and at Sunstone uh, get-togethers. And it gave me this construct, and I finally had had enough shift and heal within me that I felt comfortable attributing that sense of connection uh, and calling it God, right? But it's a totally different meaning. Uh, Richard Dawkins calls pantheism sexed up atheism because there's not a God being uh, to worship or that cares about tattoos or how many steps a person takes on a particular day of the week or the temperature of your caffeine. Those are all man-made constructs. So, so, so God saying that blacks can hold the priesthood and then they can't and then they can, that's totally man-made. That's a man-made construct. Or God saying that children of a gay parent can't be baptized and now they can, that's totally man-made. Uh, there's, that's, that's not from God. Um, those are human constructs that we create um, and, and that we're, we feel a sense of inspiration based on our experiences, and then we actualize that in, in fictions and myths and symbols and, and constructs. So um, uh, I had a conversation a couple of days ago with the Escobars, and they asked about inspiration. Do you think the Book of Mormon is aspire, inspired? They asked me. And, and I would say, I told them, I said, my reconciliation is, is, I'd ask you, do you think the Beatles were inspired when they wrote Yesterday? Of Absolutely. Course. Absolutely, they were inspired. But does that mean there was this God being breathing that through them? Or were they having a sense of connection with something greater themselves? And that give, gave them not dictating inspiration, but they were inspired by that experience, and they were able to actual, actualize that beautiful, amazing song in that. And I said, that's what scripture is. That's my reconciliation. Scripture is, sacred texts are human beings' actualization of their sense of divinity, their relationship with divinity, um, their understanding of the expectations of divinity, and they actualize it that way. And what we are working with is the Yahweh myth, and the Yahweh myth is very, very male-centric. At least that's largely what survived. There's evidences of the feminine divine. Maxine Hanks would tell you there's evidence of the feminine divine in Scripture. Um, but it's an actualization of human beings in the same way that the Beatles were inspired to, to write yesterday, right? And, and uh, I think the Escobars liked that answer and wanted to continue the conversation. But... Um, that's what I was reconciling, and, and I'm flying home on the plane, having listened to God of Human History, having seen all this beauty and devotion to the divine, and something shifted inside of me such that the devotion to divine in Mormonism that was so painful when I deconstructed it because it was part of my identity, uh, somehow it wasn't painful anymore because all it is is a symbol of devotion to the divine. At this point, I would tell a story. So, um, well, let me tell about our Mormon Spectrum group, and then I'll tell a story. So there's significant value in in-person support. I shared my story of Lindsay Hansen Park um, sitting with me, holding my hand, telling me I would be okay. As human beings... Um, uh, there's something that happens when we're in person. We mirror each other. Like we see each other in each other. People who are on the autism spectrum have a different experience maybe. But for the majority of us, when we 
see a baby smile, you know, there's a dopamine release in our system. There's a sense of connection that's so important. That's why when people are processing grief uh, or thing, things like AA are so incredibly helpful. Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. To be in person with someone, to be able to tell your story with full vulnerability and know that no matter how bad you screwed up, you're unconditionally validated and loved. It's so incredibly important. People that processed a faith crisis 20 years ago in the corner of a library in Boise, Idaho, like, I don't know how they did it. Like, my heart breaks for them, right? Um, people who process a faith, faith crisis today, listening to this episode or online in support groups, but without in-person support, it's infinitely better, but it's not the same as being in person. And um, that's why I came to Sunstone. That's why I traveled to the Church History Museum. That's why I needed to sit with people in person. And that's how we process grief. That's how we heal. Being validated. And, and whether you want to call it a spiritual connection or whether you want to call it elevation emotion or whether you want to call it whatever, it, whether you want to call it God, whatever you want to call it, when we have that shared experience and that we can, Brene Brown talks about the power of holding the hand of a stranger and sitting and listening to their story and how significant and healing that is. I needed that. And I built this, I, I created this Mormon spectrum group and it was just an online entity. And I met with some of my dear closest friends now in Billings, Montana, and I listened to their story and we would hug each other and we would cry and I would tell my story, dear, dear friends. Um, but it was time to start meeting on a regular basis. And I have a dear friend, Sarah Hughes Sabawa. She told me I could uh, mention her name. She co-leads this group with me. She's a therapist. To me, she is a gladiator. Um, she uh, was practicing uh, as a therapist in the Detro Detroit area when the policy came out. And she focused on the LGBTQ community. And she fought like a gladiator to keep those kids alive. And uh, she saw the trauma. And she is just a gift of a human being, my dear, dear friend, Sarah. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to present, co-present with Sarah in sessions at Sunstone. She co-leads our Mormon Spectrum group uh, with me. And um, we decided that beginning in January of 2018, uh, uh, we would start meeting monthly as a group. And we wouldn't publicize the group. I, I, so I have a secret Mormon Spectrum Yellowstone County group. And then I have an invitation group that people can find us with. And then I have a kind of an entity page so people can find us. And then I vet people to make sure that we don't want to introduce people to faith crisis or anything. But if people are aware of some of the problems and they want in-person support, like we'll invite them into our group. And... Um, uh, and um, so we were talking about starting to do that. And um, so I was a little concerned because I come home uh, in very early November. I'm, I'm fully um, at peace with the ambiguity that I probably won't ever return to the church because I can't belong there, because I can't say Abraham wasn't a real person or Noah wasn't a real person or the priesthood isn't a thing like you can there's like these excellent essays in dialogue last year from a BYU professor uh, Roger Terry that explain that the priesthood isn't a thing right uh, but in any event um, I can't say that and so I was at peace with that I wouldn't go to church and then uh, in mid-November uh, of 2017 I've come home I have peace. I'm okay using the word God now. I can attribute it how I want uh, in a way that's helpful for me. And, uh, and in November of 2017, there's this YSA face-to-face. -face. And Elder Ballard, remember I've been in his home, been in his office. I trust that man. I did. And Elder Oaks uh, are doing this YSA face-to-face. -face. And they're using a binder of pre-prepared notes. Like it was rehearsed. It was supposed to be question and answer, but it was totally rehearsed. It was totally clear. And in that uh, YSA face-to-face, -face, Elder Ballard said, you know, there, 
I'll paraphrase it. He said, you know, there's this perception that we've been trying to misdirect or hide or suppress difficult things or church history. And he said, I want you to know that I know the brethren and I know that due to the integrity of the brethren, there have nev- there's never, ever, ever from the beginning of time, I think meaning from the beginning of the restoration, there's never, ever been any attempt to suppress difficult information. Hmm. And hmm. I, I perceived that that was a blatant lie and a rehearsed lie and that he knew it was a lie. And um, I was holding out hope that the church could be a place that I could return to. And I knew with that, it's not going to happen. Maybe not in my lifetime. Although I have different reconciliations maybe right now, but at that time. And that was a tipping point for me. And it could have been something else. It could have been the Joseph Bishop story. It, it could have been... Uh, it could have been uh, what come, came out of the lawsuit from kind of the East Coast from that kid that went to prison for a long time about how uh, the church handles uh, allegations of sexual abuse and what Kirk and, Kurt and Mc, McConkie done. That all of those things could have been tipping points. But for me, it was Elder Ballard, in my perception, blatantly lying about that. I mean, Joseph Smith blatantly lied because he rewrote history to write out his use of the seer stone in Joseph Smith history. You know, he lied. From the beginning of time, there's been lying, right? And suppression. And, um, and so I decided to resign. Uh, I struggled with it for about a month, and I submitted my resignation through Quit Mormon. And when, I, What year was that? That was in December of 2017. Okay. And... Uh, and and, and I trust what you've suggested, and, and I did this. I wanted to be thoughtful about it. I didn't want to resign when I was processing grief. I didn't want it to be an emotionally charged choice. Um, I, I've seen people resign thinking that that would relieve their pain, but they were grieving. And that wasn't the thing that took away their pain. And so I wanted to be very thoughtful about that. And so it from crash to... Resignation. It took about 20, not 20 months. I submitted my resignation. Um, I knew how the process worked. Um, I knew, uh, first of all, I let my wife know that I had submitted it and that I needed to do this to have peace in my life. Because I needed to get rid, I needed to set a boundary um, for myself and for the leaders of the church that I'm not going to carry this underlying anxiety that you're going to somehow be a safe or healthy place for me to return. I needed to set that boundary. Also, if I was excommunicated and went back, I would not be allowed to speak in church. But if I go back as a resigned member, I can, <laughs> right? It's a weird thing. Uh, so in any event, um, so I chose to resign, and it was processed on January 5th of 2018. And, and my friend Sarah, with all her experience, said, um, sometimes that gives people a new thing to mourn. So if you need someone to sit with you in this, let me know. So, but the day that my LDS tool stopped working and I knew that I was not a member anymore, it brought me a significant sense of peace because I had set a boundary for myself and them. Also, I knew that I could support these dear people that I love in our Mormon Spectrum group without any concern that... Uh, my local leaders could feel threatened and then threaten me with discipline for supporting people as they're processing uh, a faith transition in a safe place with full validation acceptance, regardless of where they end up. We have the full spectrum in our group. I'm I'm not going to reveal other than Sarah said it was okay. And there was a couple others that said it was okay, but we have the full spectrum in our group. I mean, we have, we have nuanced believers all the way to Buddhist Mormons and non-believers and resigned people and everything in between. We ha- in our group, we have people who are active. Uh, we have people, half of them are in mixed faith marriages. We have the full spectrum and we sit with them in their journey regardless of their reconciliation. If they reconcile evangelical Christian- Christianity, we hold that for them. 
If they reconcile nuance more Mormonism, they hold that. We hold that for them. If they're in the depths of anger and they need to vent and process, we hold that for them. And and it's so important to have that in-person support. It's so critical. 